The National Good Food Network is a key initiative of the Wallace Center that illustrates our market-based strategy with the goal of moving good, more good food to more people. The NGFN is structured as a network of networks, ensuring efficient flow of information and innovation from boots on the ground projects to the national level and back down to the grassroots level across the nation. The Wallace Center coordinates and supports the network. Our goals are to work with the growers to ensure that there is an abundant supply to meet the high demand. We collect and disseminate the best models, stories, methods, and outcomes, and to ensure that policymakers are informed about the wonderful successes our networks network and partners have had so that we can continue to increase support for healthy regional food. Let me tell you about some of our current projects designed to meet those goals. A regional food hub is a business or organization that actively manages the aggregation, distribution, and marketing of source-identified food products primarily from local and regional producers for the purpose of strengthening producer capacity and access to wholesale, retail, and institutional markets. The NGFN Food Hub Collaboration has been studying hubs and will soon be coming out with a Food Hub Resource Guide published by collaboration member USDA AMS. The collaboration has established a growing community of practice where hub managers and supporters can share knowledge and best practices to accelerate this work. We will be providing technical assistance as well as communicating successes, positive impacts, and good models. The Field Guide to the New American Food Shed is a web-based tool along with a comprehensive outreach program intended to teach producers and those who might offer them credit about the wide range of business possibilities available in this new food marketplace. Learn more about this topic by watching the ARC of November 2011 NGFN webinar. The NGFN has teamed up with Farm Credit to evaluate and improve educational instruments for financial training for growers with an emphasis on working with the southern U.S. states, this program will create a toolkit of resources for those who train farmers on financial skills and business literacy. We have established a community of practice of these trainers, and working with them, we will ensure that all of the critical financial skills are effectively passed on to their students. The project also includes identifying gaps and creating content to fill those gaps. The NGFN works with partners critical to the success and impact of the NGFN, including Marty Grenzer at Morse Marketing Connections, USDA Agricultural Marketing Service, Wellspring Management, Origins, and Farm Credit Council. Together with our national and regional partners, we're working on several projects in service of the goals of the NGFN. This map gives you a sense that we truly are a national network. You should feel free to contact us at any time. Email us at contact at ngfn.org. And here are a few other email and web addresses that you should take note. So enough from me. Let me introduce today's presenter. Michael Schumann is an economist, attorney, author, and entrepreneur, and one of the world's leading experts on community economics. He has authored, co-authored, or edited eight books. His most recent book, just published by Chelsea Green, is Local Dollars, Local Sense, How to Move Your Money from Wall Street to Main Street and Achieve Real Prosperity. His previous book, The Small Mart Revolution, How Local Businesses Are Beating the Global Competition, published in 2006, received a bronze prize from the Independent Publishers Association for Best Business Book of that year. He splits his time between two organizations, the Business Alliance for Local Living Eco Economies, or BALI, and Cutting Edge Capital, LLC. He also helped uh, co-found BALI, which represents 22,000 local businesses in North America in 80 communities and now is a fellow there. At Cutting Edge Capital, a consulting firm that helps communities and businesses solving financial challenges, he manages its economic development initiatives. A prolific speaker, Schumann has been given an average of more than one invited talk per week, mostly to the local government and universities for the past 30 years. He has lectured in almost every U.S. state and eight countries. Michael? Thank you very much, Jeff. It's very nice to be with you. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity uh, to speak to uh, the folks gathered today. And I think investment is very much on all of our minds, and that's why I wrote this book, Local Dollars, Local Sense. Uh, I've been involved in promoting local business in one way or another for 15 years, and it has become clear everywhere that I go that capital is one of the single biggest challenges that people face. Um, what I hope comes out of this webinar is a couple of things. One is if you're interested in the stories that I'm just going to give you a 
very small snapshots of. Uh, there are details in the book. Um, if you're interested in going one level deeper, I actually have just begun a, a set of all-day seminars that I uh, lead around the country. I just did the first one in Princeton uh, this week, and I have a half dozen others in the next two months planned. So if your community is interested in going into more depth, please let me know. And then finally, I'll explain at the end some of the services that my colleagues at Cutting Edge Capital are prepared to do to just give on-the-ground assistance to local investment work you might want to do. I think the first place that I want to start is just to acknowledge that local business financing today is exceedingly difficult. The list on the left really constitutes the common places where at least we believe most entrepreneurs who are just getting started, food entrepreneurs or otherwise, where, where, where they are getting their capital. Uh, it might be the house, it might be credit cards, it might be banks, it might be equity investors. To that list, we should probably add the famous three Fs, friends, families, and fools. Um, what I would say, though, about each of the items in this list is that it's exceedingly difficult now to tap any of these things. Uh, because of the financial crisis, it is a lot more difficult to get second mortgages on your home uh, that might have been a source of finance. Uh, people are seeing their credit lines and credit card lines being cut, even those with very good credit. And by and large, Americans are trying to get out of debt. Banks while they are beginning to get back into the game, particularly local banks and credit unions, uh, they're, at the end of the day, more interested in providing collateralized loans for, say, real estate or for equipment than they are for working capital, which is so essential for startup businesses. And finally, there's a lot of talk about equity investors, about angels and venture capitalists and others who might support small businesses. But the fact is, is at the end of the day, these investors are almost entirely interested in established larger businesses. And there are very, very few local businesses that are the beneficiaries of these higher-end capitalists. Despite the lack of availability of capital, we know that there are huge opportunities in the localization of our food system. Uh, I have been going around the country doing studies uh, about what would be the economic impacts of what I sometimes call the 25% shift, moving 25% of the way toward food localization. I've done these studies for Cleveland and Denver. The most recent study was in Boulder County. Uh, this study was released last month, and we found that a 25% food shift in this 300,000-person county would create about 1,900 jobs, paying about $81 million, increase the uh, value added or the local equivalent of gross domestic product, $138 million and increased collection of taxes about $12 million a year. And besides that, of course, would have good environmental impacts, be good for public health, the kind of things that uh, the Wallace Center's research backs up again and again. One of the significant obstacles that comes up in all of these studies is where is the capital coming for this shift? And we calculated in Boulder County that something like $100 million of new capital would be needed. Now, $100 million sounds like it's a very big number. And at one level, it is. But if you compare that to the short-term savings that people in Boulder County have in banks, thrifts, and credit unions, that's about $7 billion that those 300,000 people have. It's about, you know, it's just a tiny fraction of that. And when you look at the long-term savings that people have in their retirement funds, it's far less than 1%. So what this really tells us 
is that even a modest, modest shift of capital from its conventional uses into local business would be a tremendous shift, a tremendous growth of local food businesses. Now, I want to give a sense of what the overall structure of capital is in the United States, um, because I think a lot of people are not entirely familiar with this. If you added up all of the wealth that people held in the United States, and that, that is households, nonprofits, finance companies, businesses, government entities, it would be something around $150 trillion. To put that money in perspective, that's about 10 times larger than the gross domestic product. Now, what this graph shows is just the household and nonprofit fraction of those assets, which is about half that number, about $70 trillion. And you can see that at the top, that green bar, about $25 trillion of that is housing, um, primarily, and a little bit of equipment that we hold, houses and so forth. Uh, the next bar is sort of just an other. Below that is business equity. These are uh, the investments that uh, all kinds of entrepreneurs have in their businesses, most of them, of course, being larger businesses. Um, below that is the securities category, and that's going to be the main thing we're going to focus on. And by securities, I mean those items that people have in long term stored away, stocks, bonds, mutual funds, pension funds, insurance funds, usually thinking about retirement. Maybe they're thinking about their kids' education. And then the final band is banks. Now, one thing I want to point out is that banks is about a quarter of the size of securities. One of the things that that means is that when you think about a campaign like Move Your Money, even if that campaign were perfectly effective in moving every last short-term dollar into a local bank and credit union, it would have a very trivial impact on the overall localization of capital because most of the need for localization comes up in the securities category. Which leads me to discuss where our money is invested in those securities. Now here's what we know uh, about local small businesses. Local small businesses constitute about half of our economy by jobs and by output. They are highly profitable, arguably at least as profitable or more so than Fortune 500 companies. These businesses are likely to become increasingly competitive as oil prices go up and the relative competitiveness of local businesses meeting local needs uh, kicks in. Yet despite that, do we in fact have 50% of our long-term assets in the 50% of the economy that is small and local? And in point of fact, it is not. Uh, in point of fact, almost none of our long-term capital is being invested in local small business. At a minimum, this represents a huge capital market failure. But frankly, it's worse than that because it means that all of us, including the locavores on this call, are systematically over-investing in Fortune 500 companies and under-investing, that is, not investing at all in local business. I want to just give you a sense of the $30 trillion or so of household finance that goes into uh, this securities category. And the biggest chunk is pensions and mutual funds and stocks, and then some small slivers for corporate bonds and life insurance. I believe that if we can get our capital markets to operate more cost effectively, uh, to operate efficiently, we should be seeing a $15 trillion shift from Wall Street to Main Street. And a $15 trillion shift 
represents $50,000 for every single person in our communities. And frankly, I mean, if you think about it, $50,000 in a 1,000 person community represents 50 million more dollars of investment capital that can come into that community. And you start doing the math in other places, and you realize how critical this chunk of money could be in growing local businesses. The big reason I believe that our capital markets are failing right now is that we have securities laws that were enacted in, the, in what I sometimes call the early Jurassic period, basically during the, the Great Depression. Uh, and we created a system that you might consider investment apartheid. We have one set of investors called the accredited investors who are allowed to invest in almost everything at any time in any way. To be an accredited investor, uh, you have to earn yourself 200000 a year or 300000 a year if you're a couple. Uh, your wealth must be a million dollars a year, uh, excluding your house. Or if you're an institution, you have to have at least five million dollars a year. And frankly, when you work out the math of who might be an accredited investor, it turns out to be probably about one or two percent of the American public. But for discussion purposes today, let's just say it is the top one percent who are accredited. The other 99% of us actually have a lot of difficulty investing. And it's exceedingly difficult, exceedingly expensive under securities laws for the 99% of us who are unaccredited to put money into the 99% of firms that are small. Why is that? Because for a business to take even $1 of unaccredited investor money, that business will have to put together a private placement memorandum. And if you go to a law firm to ask them to do that for you, it could cost ten, twenty, thirty thousand dollars, maybe even more. And if I wanted to take one dollar from hundreds of people, I would probably have to go public. And that act of going public, even with a small business and a small amount of money, would require a public offering, and that could easily cost me more than $100,000. So when a small business looks at these costs and say, is it worth it to get a couple of hundred thousand dollars more in equity capital if I have to pay lawyers fifty dollars to $100,000, uh, they will conclude that, no, it's not worth it. And the proof is that, in fact, our long-term assets are nearly 100% invested in the Fortune 500 economy. I believe that we can and should change this. And what I want to take the rest of my time to talk about is a baker's dozens of ways that we are beginning to bring unaccredited investors into local business. Um, and, and you know, some of these techniques are widely in use. Some of these techniques are just uh, in experimental use. Um, and as I said at the outset, I only can give you a taste of these now. But let's go to number one. Number one is specialty CDs, certificates of deposits. And basically, what's happening here is local businesses or local business advocates are going to banks and saying, let's create a special kind of CD that will be used exclusively to give loans to local business. And the first pioneer of this was the E.F. Schumacher Society, now called the New Economy Institute, in Great Barrington, Massachusetts. And in the 1980s, they had something called the Share microcredit program. And they approached a bank, Great Barrington Savings, which is now called Berkshire Bank, and they created this savings account, uh, which the basic understanding was um, any business that was getting a loan uh, out of these CDs would have to pass through 
two turnstiles. One was run by E.F. Schumacher Society, looking for the best businesses connected to the local economy, and one run by the bank, making sure that there was a reasonable chance of these businesses paying back the loans. And an example of a kind of loan that was financed by this was the Rawson Brook Farm, which had a bunch of goats, and they wanted to create a licensed uh, small food processing facility in order to create uh, a cheese that they could then sell in local markets. And in all, the Share Micro Credit Program gave um, a couple of dozen $3,000 loans. But in addition to the loans going out there, what happened was is that the residents of Great Barrington thought, this is a really cool program. And we should start moving, not only moving our money into these CDs, but they also started to move their business into these, into these local micro entrepreneurs that they were supporting. So they knew, if I have my money in the CDs, of course I'm going to buy this cheese at the local supermarket. This same design was taken by the Alternatives Credit Union in Ithaca, New York, um, and they created something called the Community Partnership Lending. Now, unlike, unlike the E.F. Schumacher uh, program, they decided to focus on nonprofits, and they encouraged nonprofits to bring um, investors in who would buy these CDs. Um, and uh, if if um, if they brought say a thousand dollars of of investors to buy the CDs, alternatives would then match that with a thousand dollars from the credit union. And an example of a kind of a loan that they gave is that Catholic, there was a, a local branch of Catholic Charities that was trying to help homeless people um, get into housing, and homeless people might need a deposit. So the microloans were used to support um, people who were just getting a, a job, help support them move into housing. Uh, over the last year, alternatives have actually extend, extended and expanded this program uh, to include small businesses. And they have a, an additional entrepreneurship program called SENSE, Community Enterprise Networking and Training Services. And I encourage people to look at this model as something you could do in your own community. Another model of this, which is fascinating, is is a company, Equal Exchange, which is a for-profit, uh, worker-owned for-profit in Boston that has been doing fair trade for many years. And they approached uh, their local bank, Wainwright, uh, now that bank is called Eastern, and they convinced them to set up a CD that would just provide loan capital to Equal Exchange. Um, the CD is a three-year um, CD. You have to put a minimum of $500 in. It doesn't pay a lot. It pays less than 1%. But believe it or not, a million dollars worth of these CDs has been bought, which of course has translated into a million dollars of loan capital that has come into equal exchange. And I think this is a model that suggests that any business or any group of businesses could approach a, an interested local bank or local credit union and say, let's create some specialty CDs to support our business. A second technique is cooperative investment. And here it needs to be said that co-ops uh, are special uh, for local investment because they are largely um, governed by state law. Now, there often are some securities uh, questions that come up with people um, who put money in co-ops, but at least in setting up co-ops in most states, it is not considered a security that you have to create a big public offering statement around. Um, and it varies from state to state what you need to do as we go through some of these other um, kinds of investments that co-ops have done. So um, if any of these things interests you, you might want to consult with an attorney 
to find out what exactly co-op law is like in your state. But I think the generalization still stands that there are a lot more options with a lot fewer kinds of filing demands in the co-op world than you have in the non-co-op world. And frankly, one could even think of having multiple co-op memberships. Say, you're a member of your grocery co-op, and your utility co-op, and a babysitting co-op, and a funeral co-op, like People's Memorial in the Pacific Northwest, and a health co-op. And in fact, if you added up all of these chunks of membership, which might be a couple of hundred dollars for each of these co-ops, you know, we might be talking about ten or twenty thousand dollars of investment that you have in the co-op world. And your returns don't come as cash payments per se, they come as patronage payments or perhaps as discounts on future purchases of goods and services. Um, and uh, when you work out the math, these kinds of returns that people are getting on their membership capital are really quite impressive. Now, some co-ops go further and they say when they have a capital improvement project, they will turn to their existing members and say, we would like to borrow some additional money in order to, as in the case of Weaver Street Market, we want to build another store. And they might agree that in exchange for your buying up um, some notes from them, uh, they would be paying 5, 6, 7% per year. And there's lots of stories of good co-ops, many of them grocery co-ops, that are paying extremely attractive rates um, on people, members who lend them capital. Another example is a co-op loan fund. The La Montanita co-op in New Mexico, which many of you are familiar with, is one of the larger and more impressive food co-ops in the United States. The co-op has five stores and 17,000 members, has about $30 million in annual sales. And they decided about uh, a year and a half ago to create a uh, co-op revolving loan fund. And uh, it's, it's structured in an interesting way. Uh, the co-op itself put the first $25,000 in the fund. So if any loans go south, the co-op gets the risk first. But then they invited other people to come in and buy these B-level shares at $250 a pop. And they were able to sell $100,000 of shares in under three months. They're aiming to give the people who put money into this fund a 5% rate of return, and they're trying to grow the fund right now. It's worth saying um, that uh, La Montanita is very much about local food. They're about um, how do we support more and more local producers to provide us a better and wider range of goods and services for our store. And so uh, it, it's only natural that they want to get credit to some of these farms or value-added value adding businesses um, who need them. And, and you know, I think this is a brilliant kind of design that one can start building in in grocery co-ops around the country. Another example, an investment co-op. Now, there probably are not a lot of states where this could be done right now, um, but one state where it could be done, and it was done, is Massachusetts. And this is the story of co-op power. Co-op power is an energy cooperative. Um, and uh, co-op power has 390 members who have each given $1,000 in initial membership capital. And they understand that a fair chunk of that money is going to be used to invest, that is, co-op power turns around and invests in other energy businesses, businesses that generate uh, energy efficiency audits, solar hot water production and implementation, uh, the creation of wood pellets, um, biodiesel production, and, you know, 
at one level what co-op power is doing is it's making these products available to its members, which is what a co-op naturally does, consumer co-op. But at another level, what co-op power is really doing is um, it, 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 it's making investments. It, it is an investment vehicle. And as long as co-op power invests less than 40% of its capital in these other businesses, it will not trip over a wire and become considered by the SEC as an investment company. Another example is uh, the worker-owned co-op of Evergreen Laundry. Now, worker co-ops are not nearly as common in the United States as consumer co-ops are. But the home run, the kind of pipe dream of worker co-ops is the Mondragon co-ops in the Basque Country. And Mondragon, as many of you know, was founded by um, a blind priest uh, and six unemployed steel workers who set up a bank and a bunch of factories. And today, uh, since 1956, Mondragon has expanded in 256 companies that employ 85,000 people and have annual sales of $20 billion. And the most amazing thing about Mondragon is that not a single person has ever been laid off. When one of those companies fails, and sometimes they do fail, those employees are systematically brought back in to other companies. So someone who was inspired by this was Ted Howard of the Democracy, Democracy Collaborative in Maryland. And he decided to work with some folks on the ground in Cleveland uh, to create uh, the Evergreen Cooperatives. And it's starting with a worker-owned laundry. Um, and the idea is, is that if you work for this laundry and you become a member of the worker co-op, um, you get a raise and a chunk of the money that you get in your raise starts to get put into a fund for the long-term use of the laundry. And it's estimated that over 10 years of working at the laundry, you will accumulate an equity base of about $60,000. And that equity then gets reinvested in the co-op. And there are other related entities in this sort of evergreen network. There's an effort to create now Green City Growers, which is uh, going to be a hydroponic greenhouse. Ohio Co-op Solar already exists and is operating. There are plans for a recycling and a data storage company. Um, and one of the things that they have done is they've created an evergreen co-op development fund that has literally funded, funneled millions of dollars from the Cleveland Foundation and from New Markets tax credits and from other sources to help support this network of self-investing co-ops. Number three, tool number three, is called LION. LION stands for the Local Investment Opportunities Network. And the gentleman there is James Fraser. James Fraser uh, used to be an investment advisor. Um, and uh, he, he, is, uh, he lives in, in Port Townsend, Washington, which has a population of about 10,000. Now, one of the little peculiarities of existing securities law is that even if you're talking about accredited investors, if you're a small local food business and want to approach the accredited investor, you can't do it unless you have a pre-existing relationship. So what Fraser very cleverly decided to do is start throwing a monthly party. And the monthly party introduces small business people with uh, small investors. And they are establishing pre-existing relationships. And he records who has the pre-existing relationships. And then he gets a steady stream of business plans. And whenever there are pre-existing relationships, he starts to circulate those business plans. Lion is a wonderful little concept social invention that is now being deployed in a bunch of cities around the United States. Tool number four, sponsorships. There are internet sites like Kickstarter and Indiegogo, and these are not investment sites per, 
per se. These are sites where people can sponsor businesses. So, for example, in this slide here, a Kickstarter, uh, you have the potential to sponsor the Copper Harvest Microbrewery. And uh, they're trying to raise $20,000. If you give a little bit of money, and you can give money in increments as small as um, one dollar here, um, if you give a little bit of money, maybe you'll get a t-shirt. If you give a lot of money, maybe you'll get the beer named after you. Because the t-shirt and the name of the beer are not regarded as real returns on your investment, this is not considered a security. So these sites have been online for more than a year, and they are raising tens of millions of dollars a year. Another example of a kind of internet lending mechanism that would be could be available to local small food businesses would be sites like Kiva. Now, Kiva is mostly working now uh, in it's like it's like a an electronic Muhammad Yunus con connecting investors in the north with good micro entrepreneurs in the south. Um, because Kiva does not collect interest, it just gets your principal paid back, in most US states it is not regarded as a security. Um, there are a couple of, of exceptions. And so so Kiva uh, has been a you know a, a another lovely thing that has fit into a an exemption within securities law, an exception, I guess would be a better term. There are some Americans, like my friend Claudia Beek of the California Association of Microenterprise Opportunity, Cameo, who's discussing with Kiva how we can begin to use this kind of platform for getting money into the hands of US-based micro-entrepreneurs. In the meantime, there are other internet lending sites that are uh, clearly in the for-profit vein. Prosper and the Lending Club are examples. Uh, they actually had to do securities filings to get kosher. But now that they're there, it's possible for local entrepreneurs to use the sites to get capital from others around the country. Now, I have to say, I'm a little nervous about some of these peer-to-peer -peer sites because, in a way, uh, they are moving people away from local investment. You may have no idea whether the person you're investing in, you're making a loan to, is in your backyard or several thousand miles away. And uh, the photo I have at the bottom of this slide, the funding circle, is a UK-based uh, lending platform that actually does identify the location of people and has created city-specific funding circles. And that is really the direction I would love to see these internet lending sites in the United States go. Tool number six is slow munis, the use of municipal bonds to support local small business. Um, out of both our Cleveland report, and I did the Cleveland report with Leslie Schaller and Brad Massey, who many of you are familiar with, and I did the report in Boulder uh, with Michael Brownlee and Transition Colorado. And in both cases, we promoted as one of the big uh, uh, initiatives that would come out of the study the creation of these slow munis, these municipal bonds. Now, municipal bonds are used all of the time to support really dumb kinds of economic development turkeys that are involved in the attraction or retention of big non-local businesses. So why not use these kinds of bonds to support local business? And so what we proposed in Boulder, for example, is that we would use municipal bonds, um, and these bonds, by the way, are are tax exempt, um, that is, people who get interest on the bonds uh, get that interest tax free. So, but our proposal was that we would create these food bonds in Boulder, and then the proceeds would be used to collateralize loans from local banks and credit unions that went to the top most promising local food businesses in Boulder. 
uh, since almost every community in the United States has some form of municipal bonding authority, this is something that all of us could take advantage of right now. Number seven, pre-sell, pre-selling. If you pre-sell goods and services, in most cases, this is also not regarded as a security. And an example of a pre-sale is the Awaken Cafe in Oakland. Uh, they needed $100,000 to open a new cafe, and one of the ways they got a chunk of that money was to sell their coffee products in advance to their existing customers. Basic deal was you buy $1,200 worth of future coffee today, and you can do so at $1,000. Believe it or not, they were able to raise 40 of their $100,000 through this pre-sale um, tool. Tool number eight, creating local stock. Um, local stock is basically going public in a small-scale way, and every state has provisions for your issuing stock that can only be purchased by people living within your state. So an example is the mercantile in Powell, Wyoming. Um, Powell, Wyoming is a small mountainous community. They had no place to buy socks and underwear. So they decided uh, they were going to build their own general store. This was about 10 years ago. They needed a half million dollars to do so. They got some volunteer legal assistance to create a small stock issue. You had to be a resident of Wyoming uh, to buy the stock. And then they sold the stock like Girl Scout cookies, door to door. They quickly got the money together. This thing has been profitable over the last 10 years. It's gone terrifically. There's a half dozen other Mercs like this in the Rocky Mountain states. And another example of local stock um, is from Mount Air. Iowa. Fifteen years ago, uh, Mount Air decided they needed a local grocery store, and an entrepreneur named Jeff Hauglin created something called Community Grocers. He again created a small stock issue, sold it to about 350 people in the community, raised the money, and got his supermarket up and running. Um, one of the things that should be noted about local stock is that once you're a shareholder of something like community grocers, I mean, even if you find better deals at, say, the Walmart Supercenter, are you going to do your shopping there? Of course not, because you actually profit from your grocery store doing really well. And not only that, you become one of the great marketing mouthpieces for the grocery store. So this turned out to be a very clever business decision for Jeff Hauglin. By the way, over the last 15 years, he has paid an average of 5.25% per year dividend uh, to his original investors. So this was a very successful local stock issue. Now, I want to comment on what is going on on Capitol Hill literally as we speak. At the end of last year, um, there were a bunch of people led by the Tea Party, uh, the Tea Party right, but also supported by many Occupy Wall Street Democrats, to begin to overhaul the crazy securities laws that prevent investment in local business. And uh, the guy at the top there, Patrick McHenry of North Carolina, um, got a bill together that basically would redo the bottom tier of securities laws. And his his law would 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 you know if if it's passed in pure Dick Henry terms uh, would create a ten thousand dollar exception to basically any person whether or not they were unaccredited could put ten thousand dollars per year per company um, in there as an investment with very little legal rigmarole. Believe it or not, this piece of legislation passed 410 to 17 uh, last December. Well, the Senate has been agonizing about what to do with this particular piece of legislation. And uh, it's 
there was a new compromise that was announced two days ago um, by Senator Brown from Massachusetts, a Republican, um, and Senator Merkley of Oregon, a Democrat, and it whittles down the $10,000 to $2,000, and this bill is going to go to committee. There's going to be a lot more debate over it, but it's worth saying that we may be on the precipice of a whole new world, and the issuance of local stock, which might have once costed $100,000 or more, could be very inexpensive. And so this option really becomes a very real one for those of you listening to this call. And so keep your eyes on the ball of what happens to this crowdfunding legislation. Even if that legislation does not pass, it's worth mentioning that there are reforms that are occurring out there that I think will totally overhaul the universe. Um, Nolo Press 25 years ago started to create these do-it-yourself books around wills and divorce. Uh, lawyers were not very happy with these things, but they've become very popular. And what we are going to begin to start seeing are do-it-yourself uh, public offerings. And my colleagues at Cutting Edge Capital are beginning to develop these kinds of products uh, for California and we're thinking about some other states as well. So the costs of doing these public offerings can and will be greatly brought down. Of course it is not enough to simply create a critical mass of local stocks because to really make local stock work we need to have liquidity in these markets. We need to have local stock exchanges. The good news is, is that there already is a company, Mission Markets, which for fifty dollars to $100,000 will work with your community to create a portal, a local or a statewide or even a regional portal that could allow you to buy and sell these public offerings, small public offerings. Um, no one has taken up this offer yet, but perhaps the first place to do so will be the state of Hawaii. Last year, the state of Hawaii passed a bill saying, sort of ordering their economic development uh, uh, department to really think seriously about creating a Hawaii stock exchange, and they are in discussions with mission markets to do this. There are some lower dollar approaches uh, that are being looked at as well. Uh, the Lancaster Exchange, the Lanax, is being done in Pennsylvania by this guy on the right named Trexler Profit. Now, another kind of approach is creating a grassroots investment fund. And it needs to be said that investment funds generally do not allow the participation of accredited investors. In fact, there's 7,500 mutual funds out there. Um, they do allow unaccredited investors, but those 7,500 mutual funds do not invest at all, none of them, in local small business. Um, could you create a hedge fund, a special fund of local money to invest in local business? You could, but unaccredited investors could not participate in it. There's an exception, though, for grassroots loan funds. That is, if you give small loans to small businesses, you can involve unaccredited investors. And so an example of a fund that has done this in support of local small food businesses is RSF, Social Finance, in San Francisco. Uh, they now have a fund of about $300 million that if you have a local food business, you might consult with them about taking a loan from them. And it's being done at a grassroots level. Uh, this guy here um, uh, actually has a fund in Columbus, Ohio. His name is uh, 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 Fireman. And he, uh, he has a nonprofit called the Economic and Community Development Institute. They have 14 funds that they operate, but their newest fund uh, does take unaccredited money, investors, and they are giving loans to local food businesses. 
and it does suggest a nice precedent that other people can look at. Another example of a kind of local fund that you can do, an investment club. You are allowed to set up a small group in your community where all of you collectively invest in local businesses. Um, now, the key thing about an investment club is that everyone has to be involved in all of the key decisions. You can't have someone step forward and say, okay, I'll, I'll make the decisions for the group because then you'll be considered an investment company. And an example of this is the No Small Potatoes Investment Club in Maine. Um, they are focused on local food businesses. They're a part of the Slow Money organization, which has grassroots groups popping up around the country. Three of them actually have started investment clubs. And this particular investment club went to the securities regulators in Maine and asked for and received permission to be able to uh, put money in small loans into small businesses and to do so with unaccredited investors in the investment club. Tool number 12 is business development companies, or BIDCOs. And the significance of a BIDCO is this. Suppose you wanted to create a food incubator. And suppose you wanted that food incubator not only to be providing property to those businesses, but also investment into those businesses. Could that food business incubator take unaccredited investment dollars? No, because it would be regarded as an investment company. But there is one exception um, in the law for business development companies that offer very specific kinds of technical support for small businesses. And the guy on the left is um, someone who sometimes works with cutting edge capital named Ken Priory who has developed some expertise in BIDCOs and is working with us now to try to figure out how to make this kind of tool available to agglomerations of local food businesses in particular communities. Number 13, last on our list, is a secret weapon that is so secret that a dummy's book has been written about it, the self-directed IRA. Now, I mentioned before that in the mutual fund universe and in the pension fund universe, it is virtually impossible to use your tax-deferred money and invest in local small business. But if you roll over some of that money, and it's not always easy to do it, but sometimes you can and you have to consult with your employer to figure out how and when you can do that. But if you can roll over your IRA money into a self-directed IRA, and there are people in the country who will do self-directed IRAs for as little as one or two hundred dollars per year um, as a custodian, you can then start putting your money into everything that we talked about. You could put it into interesting kinds of local certificates of deposit. You could put it into local co-op projects. You could put it into local stock. You could put it into local stock markets. You could put it into your investment club. The only thing you cannot use your self-directed IRA money for is investing in your own house. But an interesting thing is, is you could invest in your neighbor's house, and your neighbor could invest in your house. And therein suggests a possibility that we at Cutting Edge Capital are also beginning to think about, which is how we can help people take advantage of the mortgage interest deduction and do so with tax deferred dollars from their IRA. The last point that I want to make about all of these ideas that I've just gone over with you is that we are at the beginning of an extremely powerful movement. I believe that ultimately this movement could be the biggest movement of capital, $15 trillion from Wall Street to Main Street. Now, what happens when the first trillion dollars or so of this money begins to shift, when these experiments get slightly more mature, when crowdfunding reform passes Congress and many more businesses create local stock? Well, I think, you know, when the first trillion dollars shifts, 
Wall Street securities prices will go down because the demand is going to be less. And people will get more nervous about keeping their money on Wall Street and look more seriously at the local alternatives. And we'll shift another trillion, and then another, and another. I think this dam of capital could burst open really quite quickly. And I want to just say that um, we at Cutting Edge Capital really view ourselves as here to help make this $15 trillion shift possible. And I did want to introduce uh, my colleagues. John Katowicz on the left used to be the Council General for the San Francisco Stock Exchange and then the Boston Stock Exchange. And he is doing our pioneering work um, trying to create local stock exchanges around the country. Jenny Casson in the middle is an attorney, a securities attorney with a great deal of specialization in direct public offerings and in co-op law and in nonprofit law. And then I focus on sort of broader education about local investment and on how we can mobilize uh, communities through specific studies about what the power of local investment and other kinds of local business development might be. So let me stop here and we can open it up for questions. Great, thank you. Michael, what a, a cascade of information. Um, let me just, uh, a couple people wanted to know the definition of a BIDCO. So, a, yes, a BIDCO is a business development company. And uh, with, without getting really technical about it, think of it as a kind of a venture capital company that is focused on small business and offers those businesses not just money, but also a lot of technical assistance. So it's kind of a mesh of a, of a venture fund and a um, incubator. Okay, great. Um, where would someone find out uh, which states consider co-ops a public offering? Well, um, my, I don't know one website that has um, all of that information in there, but um, I know for our clients at Cutting Edge Capital, we have, you know, we will quickly do that research for you if you need it and help guide you uh, about what the legal requirements would be to take e any of these particular kinds of uh, uh, loan possibilities that we talked about. Okay. Actually, some were loans, some were investments, some mm -hmm. were uh, just memberships. Mm -hmm. um, so this is, um, I'm going to ask you uh, to put on your, uh, as if you were an investor cap, uh, and um, think about two, two different sectors people are asking about for um, how, how attractive are these sectors, in your opinion, uh, to local investment? The first is um, a food hub. Uh, so this is an aggregator uh, and distributor of primarily local food product. Yeah. Well, I think um, in, our, in, our, in our study of Metro Cleveland, um, we came to the conclusion that um, these intermediate businesses, that is the businesses that sort of could pull together a, a bunch of farmers on the one hand and maybe a bunch of small producers, uh, value-added producers, and then connect them with a bunch of grocery stores and restaurants and other purchasers, that those intermediaries were the critical missing link in most local food systems. And so, you know, I mean, we're talking about processing, we're talking about packaging, we're talking about um, distribution and transportation and the wholesaling. And so all of these things, you know, are part of various food hub designs. And I really think these are the absolute priorities for building local food systems. And if they're the priorities, they also are the businesses that have, I think, the greatest chance of success. Great. Yeah, good. Good uh, to hear a positive opinion on that. And what about um, uh, 
uh, software development companies in service of um, a local food system? Um, well, you know, let, let's just generalize a little bit about all kinds of businesses because it's it's um, sure software software is needed for this stuff. Um, I think that the most compelling cases that I've seen for you know various software companies is taking existing software and just improving it, improving it or reapplying it. Um, to particular food system, food business needs. I think during the dot-com bubble, um, we saw lots of companies, especially lots of startups, waste huge amounts of money on creating software packages from scratch, and then you know to, to discover that something about their business model was not right. So I think that if the software um, companies can show that you know, for a relatively low dollar expenditure, you can redeploy a lot of intellectual capital that's already been invested and put it to the use of local food businesses. It could be a good, compelling sell. Um, people are asking about the studies, the Cleveland and Boulder studies. Are those accessible someplace? Yes. The um, so the Cleveland study. I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to uh, change the slide there. Um, the Cleveland study um, is available. I'd, I'd have to go check on the address, um, but we could post that on on the site. Sure. Um, and uh, but 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 the principal colleagues that we worked with were um, the, uh, the there was the Food Policy Council of of Cleveland. And then ASNET, uh, Leslie Schaller uh, works with ASNET. They were they were a critical partner as well. And then ParkWorks was a group on the ground that sponsored the study, and they get most of their funding from the Cleveland Foundation. Uh, the Boulder study, I believe, is posted. Um, we have to, we completed it a couple weeks ago. I know they were doing a little bit of redesign of some of the pieces. And that can be that's available at the Transition Colorado uh, website. And unfortunately, I haven't memorized um, what the URL is. But if you just put in to Google Transition Colorado, you will get there. Great, um, TransitionColorado.org. Thanks, Chris. Um, <clears throat> can a group of companies create a co-op, or do co-ops have to be founded by individuals? Absolutely. Um, Co-ops come in a variety of flavors. So uh, most of the examples that I gave were of consumer co-ops, um, but not all. So the Evergreen Co-op is a um, employee co-op, and, and as I mentioned, you know, in other countries, employee co-ops are very popular, such as in Spain and with Mondragon. But in this country, really a small percentage of the co-op universe is worker-owned and controlled. But then um, there is a fairly sizable chunk of the co-op universe uh, that is a producer or a purchasing co-op. And you know, good examples of that might be True Value Hardware or Ace How Hardware. So these are all local hardware stores that are members of this larger co-op that goes out and buys goods around the planet at you know good bulk purchase prices, and then you're able to compete effectively against Home Depot. And you know, in the food universe, there are um, some of these kinds of producer and purchasing co-ops as well. IGA is an example, but I think we need a lot more of them. And to the extent that you know we can get more local food businesses to come together to do collective purchasing in a producer co-op, uh, they will be more competitive. Um, does cutting edge capital consult with companies across the company, uh, the country rather? Yes. We, um, I mean, to give you a sense of the groups that I have worked with this past year, um, I've been, I, I've done economic development work with two counties in North Carolina. Cabarrus and Davidson, and with Berea, Kentucky, 
and have done these food studies in Ohio, uh, Boulder, and uh, and Denver. And uh, now we're, we're just beginning to do some work on a uh, local investment fund um, uh, in, in western Massachusetts for the Solidago Foundation. They've got a small fund now. They want to grow that and that will be focused on local food. Um, we've got some clients in Washington State, a lot of clients in California. So it is spread across the country, and frankly, we're spread across the country. So Jenny and John are in Oakland. Uh, I live in Maryland, and then we have a lot of people who work for us um, uh, in, in more kind of part-time capacities um, spread around the country in between. There's some a lot of interest in the specialty CDs and how uh, if there are resources or techniques to convince local banks to to take them on. Well, I'll tell you. Um, I when I did um, my first workshop, all day workshop in Princeton uh, on Tuesday, um, maybe ten of the sixty people who were there were bankers, um, and it didn't take a lot of persuasion to convince them that this was a home run for them. Because the, the basic argument is, look, um, win or lose, these CDs are going to make you money. That is, you have money in the bank. And if these local loans succeed, you know, great. Um, and if they don't succeed, they are 100% collateralized with these CDs. And either way, you get to an administrative fee um, for running the program. So uh, I think that uh, any bank that is interested in working with a lot of local businesses will see this as attractive. So, and, and perhaps in that last sentence is the one objection you might run up against, which is that, you know, many people in business have a natural predilection to work with one big client rather than a bunch of little clients. Uh, because the transaction costs are a lot smaller. But, you know, those of us who are involved in the local economy movement know that, you know, what makes up the local economy are a lot of small players. And frankly, local banks, local credit unions establish their niche as being the one place that is prepared to work with these smaller businesses. Here's one interesting factoid that, you know, small and medium-sized banks um, account for um, about a fifth of the total capital assets of banks in the United States, and yet are responsible for more than half of the small business lending in this country. So it kind of underscores what kind of priority they put into the small businesses. So I, I think that by pointing your bankers in the direction of these three models that actually exist and succeeded, um, you can overcome any skepticism. Great. That's, that's, uh, that's good news. Um, do you, just off the top of your head, do you have examples of houses of worship being business incubators? Houses of worship being business incubators? Um, Mark I mean, is I suggesting. Know, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. yeah. I mean, so, so business incubation is sometimes a question of space, and there's no question that churches have space, surplus space, not all of them, but many do, that could be deployed uh, for, for, for incubation. Um, one example that I'm thinking of is not a church, so I'm not quite, I'm dodging the question, but there's an example of, of public schools in Washington, D.C. Uh, that allowed their food facilities to be used by a local um, kid-run cookie company. Um, and, and I thought that was, that was an interesting model. Uh, but, but I don't see any conceptual reason why you couldn't have churches doing it. It's just when you get more complicated kinds of businesses. So when you move into you know, production and you need specialty licenses and the facilities um, rebuilt in certain ways in order to comply with, you know, certain zoning or health requirements, 
then I would imagine you could not just use a church basement. You would really, you would really need a, a special dedicated facility. <laughs> All right. Well, there are several um, uh, interesting questions that I'm sorry that we are unable to get to, but uh, I do want to make sure we finish on time. So um, I'm going to thank you very much, Michael, um, and uh, let people know that um, this webinar is being recorded uh, and will be archived on our site. So if there's something that that you missed, or if you want to share this with a, a colleague, um, it, it will be on our site, and you should get an email tomorrow with the direct link. Um, we also have uh, three dozen other past webinars, and they are organized by topic. So if you go to ngfn.org slash webinars, um, you can uh, browse through our archives there. There's really some uh, other tremendous webinars. We do offer the NGFN webinars every third Thursday of each month. However, uh, April, we're we're taking the month off, uh, so that's a that's a great time to set aside some time to review those those archives. I want to let you know about three other Wallace Center websites. Foodhub.info is a food hub hub of information, research, case studies, a map of many of the food hubs across the country, which we will soon be updating, even links to technical assistance providers with experience in aggregation and distribution. If you are a TA provider or consultant on this call, you should take some time and create or update your profile on ngfn.org. This is becoming an established place for those in need of assistance to find their help, so you want to be listed there. HughFed.org is our site for the Healthy Urban Food Enterprise Development Center run by the Wall Center. This program and website is focused on increasing access to food to underserved communities using market-based solutions. There are several access questions that we were unable to get to, so those people may be particularly interested. On the site, you'll find a description of the initiatives, uh, the, our 30 grantee profiles and photos, and a library of some of the best food access resources. If you have a resource you'd like to share, let us know. Contact at ngfn.org or hufed at winrock.org. And we do have a monthly newsletter that you can sign up for the HUFED program at the end of this webinar. And foodshedguide.org is our site for producers wanting to adapt to the changing food business landscape. We have instructive test, text and case studies and with an emphasis on how to have a viable business in a food value chain. Learn more about, for instance, factors to consider when deciding on legal status, such as an LLC or a C Corp. Visit foodshedguide.org for more. You can find the NGFN on YouTube, on Twitter, and on our website, ngfn.org. I'd like to encourage you to add your name, interests, and bio to that growing database of people and organizations. And this is all part of our service to you as connector. So look for the database link in the resources section. And if you haven't already, sign up for our email updates. There's a link on the ngfn.org homepage, or just let us know on the post-webinar survey, and we'll sign you up. Please contact us at any time. Again, the email address is contact at ngfn.org. The NGFN would like to thank you for your time today and Michael's time. And once again, let me encourage you to fill out the survey that should open in your browser in just a moment. This concludes the webinar. <laughs>